Hello everyone. Welcome back to the University of the Witwatersrand Fossil Hominid Vault here in Johannesburg, South Africa. I'm Lee Berger, a paleoanthropologist here at the university and explorer at large for the National Geographic Society. Today, I'm going to be introducing one of the challenge videos, the killer cats of Gladys Vale. This story is about leopards and their prey and how we use modern examples of collecting behaviors of animals to interpret the deep past. In early 1991, I was spending a significant amount of time exploring the caves of the Dolomitic landscapes north and west of Johannesburg. I was, of course, exploring this area in search of potential fossil sites I might excavate, as I was a young paleoanthropologist looking for an opportunity. It was still six months before the first hominids would be found by my teams in the nearby Gladysville Cave, which I hadn't discovered yet. In exploring a large wilderness area, I came across a cave with the smell of carrion coming from it. Well, that's where I did something truly stupid. I climbed down into the darker recesses of this cave to spite the smell. And there, I bumped into a female leopard. She was sitting over a kill. And then two cubs emerged, and within a matter of seconds, she charged me. She scrambled up a debris cone, but luckily lost her footing. That startled her as much as it startled me. She made a hasty retreat out of another entrance. I was left there with two cubs in partial darkness with only my torch. Well, I made a hasty retreat and was a lot more cautious from then on before descending into any caves. Months later, I would be brought back to the exact same cave. The farm manager had found a huge cache of antelope bodies in what was now a deserted cave. The accumulation the female leopard had made, almost certainly while weaning her cubs, was still relatively fresh. Well, fresh in the ways of months-old mummified carcasses. The site was a spectacular example of a modern collecting behavior by a wild animal in a relatively pristine environment, even though it was just on the outskirts of Johannesburg. There were whole bodies of medium and, and more surprisingly, large antelopes, and even the carcass of an elan, the largest antelope in Africa. At that time, there were no reports of leopards killing and caching such large animals and even further, almost no reports of leopards as active collecting agents of bones in caves, particularly dolomitic caves. I photographed the remains, intending to actually conduct a study on the leopard layer at that time, but Gladysville Cave was discovered just a few months later, and I was distracted by the hominid finds from there. It wasn't until the late 1990s that Daryl DeRyder and I would go back to that cave to conduct a proper scientific analysis of the remains that were there. Before I delve into the science, though, that resulted from this work, I'd like to touch on conservation. It might surprise you to learn that these large carnivores, like leopards and hyenas, actually live on the edge of, and even within, large Afghan cities like Johannesburg. The wilderness area where many of these fossil sites occur lies just minutes away from this megacity. Vast wilderness areas surround the cave-forming dolomites have been preserved by conscientious landowners and the government. The area is rich in game and forms both a tremendously important conservation area, as well as a rich laboratory for studying modern analogs of what might have happened hundreds of thousands and even millions of years ago, as the caves where we find important fossils of ancient human relatives and the animals that lived around them accumulated over that vast period of time. But why would we want to study such an occurrence, and why, again, would we want to write a scientific paper on it? Well, the first reason is that these caves where we find fossils, and even surface sites, are basically just places where collections of bones accumulated in the past, and through burial and saturation with calcium carbonate and other minerals have become fossilized. These collections are all the product of some mechanism of bone collecting. It might be natural process like 
flooding that kills lots of animals and sweeps their bodies into a cave and buries them. It might be a death trap where animals have fallen into the cave to be covered and preserved, or more often than not, they're accumulations made by some animal that was either storing the bones themselves or the dead animal's meat for later use as they often can't eat all the meat at one time. And if they left it on the open savanna, it would soon be scavenged and lost. Sometimes these bones were collected by a predator who killed the animal or a scavenger taking parts left over from a kill away from such a scene. In any case, the goal is generally concealment and storage of the remains. As I mentioned, either for their own consumption or maybe even to feed their young, like in the case of the Gladysville leopard. What this does for us paleontologists is lead millions of years later, to the potential of protection of the remains so that they can potentially become fossils that ultimately we just might find. By determining what the mechanism of delivery of a bone into a cave or the situation we find it in, whether it's a den or a food cache, for example, helps a paleontologist determine the way a situation originally accumulated, which then gives us behavioral information about the bone collector itself and the life and death of the animal they cached. We might be able to tell such things as where the predator or scavenger sat in the food chain, perhaps how it died, and the same information might be understood for the prey animals themselves. Such a site can also give us clues to how representative any bone collection might be of the world outside of the cave or collection spot thus letting us know how we might use these clues to reconstruct past environments. And really, as paleontologists, our ultimate goal is to reconstruct the past, whether it's the past of an individual animal, a species, or a whole ecosystem. And just as the fossil sites are precious and rare windows into the past and nests of clues to that past, so are these modern analogs clues that might help us interpret the past more accurately. For the modern situation, we can examine it against a known real world just outside the cave, while we have no such luxury when separated by millions of years in time from the fossil occurrences. And so a modern analog, like the Gladysville leopard layer, can be used as a recreation of events that might have gone on in the past, and so we study them. They're invaluable because they may give us insight into past behaviors and even the fossilization process itself. In simplistic terms, it's like investigating a crime scene where you know who the perpetrator is and using that information to build clues to solve another crime that took place somewhere else. Only in this case, the event took place in the deep past, hundreds of thousands or millions of years ago. So such places as the Gladysville leopard layer are critically important, and we call this part of our field the science of taphonomy, or the study of how things are buried. So let's take a quick look at what we know about leopard behavior and the way they store or cache their prey. Leopards cache prey for a variety of reasons, but it's most usually because they want to keep that prey away from other predators and scavengers in the modern environment, animals like lions and hyenas who might steal it. Thus, getting a carcass as quickly as possible into an inaccessible location is a big bonus for food conservation for animals such as leopards. Bob Brain, one of the founders of the science of taphonomy, had looked at leopards as important potential bone collectors of the fossil assemblages of the Dolomitic cave sites. He'd found actual evidence of leopard bite marks on hominid skulls, in fact. But he had emphasized leopards as using the trees that often grow in the mouths of caves as the source of those bones. As most researchers of living leopards thought of the cats primarily as tree cachers, not really using the caves themselves. This assumption of leopards as only tree cachers, has important implications for the condition of the bones leopards might bring in as if the bones are just falling from the limbs of a tree above a cave entrance into the cave to be buried, then this would result in mostly fragments and loose bones ending up on the floor of the cave to be ultimately buried. On the other hand, 
If the bones didn't get into the cave as fragments over time, but came in whole as part of a body being dragged, you can readily see how the end result would be dramatically different for what we would find in the future as we excavated. Now, this would be particularly true if the leopard didn't consume the whole carcass. The fact that the Gladysville leopard was taking whole carcasses into the cave might have tremendous importance for the way we interpret collecting behaviors and how bones got into caves originally in the deep past. The fact that this cat and its young had not consumed all of the bodies, even those of smaller animals, was a very different profile to that predicted by actualistic studies where leopards had been fed remains and where ultimately most of the carcasses had been consumed, leaving only certain inedible body parts. Wild leopards were behaving differently than fed captive leopards. Also, it's important to remember that if remains are not just falling from bodies cached in trees slowly as a carcass falls apart over time, then a big cat-derived assemblage might look very different than we had previously hypothesized. And cats like leopards could be responsible for even articulated hominids, for example, that are found in caves. Thus, the real-world situation we found in the Gladysville leopard layer seemed to demonstrate a potentially different end result than some experimental studies, or observations made on wild leopards not in the proximity of dolomitic caves. I think it's not hard to see how scientists can use this type of evidence to real effect when looking at ancient assemblages. A second important finding of this discovery was that leopards in dolomitic regions could take prey much larger than in areas like the low felt of southern Africa and East African savannas, where most studies of leopard hunting behavior had been made. Most of these studies of leopards suggested they only took small and medium-sized prey, up to impala and the juveniles of other species. And when they cache prey, they do it by hauling the carcass up into a tree. But the Gladysville leopards were different. In the main layer, she took many much larger animals down into the darkness, including many adult antelopes and at least one other predator, a lynx. Furthermore, we found a second leopard layer with large remains in it just a kilometer away from the first one. This one contained an adult zebra skeleton, effectively whole. We had no way of knowing if this was the same leopard specializing in large prey, but the signs demonstrated that this leopard as well was highly capable of killing large animals far beyond what is normally reported for prey size in leopards and more typical of the prey taken by lions, which can weigh three or four times the body weight of an average leopard and of course hunt in prides, not alone as is the habit of leopards. And we observed that leopards in the area of Gladysville actually use caves at least as much as they use trees to cache prey, keeping it away from abundant hyenas and jackals that live in the area today. Now an important question arises. How are leopards, which are relatively small animals, typically weighing only around 80 to 100 pounds, even killing animals like eland and zebras, which can weigh from 300 kilograms upwards or 500 to 1,000 pounds? Well, the answer, of course, isn't easy to test, but it may be due to two factors which are related directly to the dolomites themselves. One is that antelope and other animals may be more vulnerable on the rugged, uneven surfaces of dolomites, and it appears that leopards in the region use this as a hunting advantage. They simply have to startle animals or minimally grapple with them, and the animal, in fleeing, risks severe injury on the sharp and dangerous rocks, thus making them vulnerable to being killed. This is something that hadn't been considered before and may be how these leopards were tackling such big prey. You can imagine that the hunting strategy of an animal in a non-rocky environment, which is where most leopards up until then had been studied, might be very different. And this could dramatically affect both prey type selection as well as the body size of prey a leopard might tackle. The other factor may be that the leopard could use the advantage of gravity in taking the prey down into the cave rather than 
up into a tree. And this means she could take much larger prey than she would normally if she were limited to what she could lift up into a tree. Dragging is, after all, easier than lifting, particularly down slope. So maybe the dolomitic leopards are just taking greater chances when it comes to prey size because they can. So two important things have been demonstrated by this discovery so far. One is that leopards use caves to cache bones, and they often leave behind substantial parts of the bodies, unlike what we find from either tree cached remains or captive animal studies, emphasizing the need to study more situations in the actual environments where we find fossils, rather than relying wholly on analogs either from other regions or from artificially created situations. It's not to say those are bad, it's just where do we put more weight on the science? Real world examples of animal behavior are almost always better than using, for example, captive animals to reconstruct animal behavior in the past. Also, this discovery allowed us to watch the decomposition of the mummified and loose bone remains over almost a decade. This showed, I think remarkably, that while there was significant deterioration of the remains, some still maintained skin, dried flesh, and joining ligaments even after such a long period due to the sheltering effects of the cave environment itself. One can easily see how useful this is to understanding articulated remains of fossils we find, and how long they might have remained exposed, for example, like those of Sediba, Naledi, and Littlefoot, which are often thought to be buried near instantaneously in order for such a quality of preservation to have occurred. But this, the Gladysville leopard layer proved, is not necessarily so. Bones and articulation can survive surprisingly a very long time, and the bones themselves even longer due to the protective nature of the cave environment. Our science relies on such taphonomic studies in order to more accurately reconstruct past environments and the situations where we find fossils, and we need more young scientists reporting on such finds. And we need more people in the field doing real-world observations of wild animal behavior particularly as those situations are becoming more and more rare due to human encroachment on wilderness areas. So that's just a quick look at why such taphonomic situations as the Gladysville leopard layer are useful for potentially interpreting the past. This, of course, applies to other animals as well. Animals like hyenas, any animal that in fact could scavenge and leave remains in places where they might become fossils. Just one last message though. Uh, animals like the Gladysville leopard, which lost its life shortly thereafter, lost its life because of human pressures. There are probably less than 100,000 leopards left on the continent of Africa, and that sounds like a lot. It's not that many. These leopards have lost more than 75% of their wild habitats, and Leopards like the Gladysville leopard, unfortunately there are still leopards out in this region today, are constantly in a struggle and competition with humans for space and habitat. Without them, the world is a poorer place. It's a poorer place for us humans and not sharing the world with these magnificent animals. It's a poorer place for science. So I hope you've enjoyed this brief look at why the science of taphonomy is important, why real-world examples like the killer cats of Gladysville are important for scientific study. I'm Lee Berger. You can follow me on Twitter at Lee R. Berger or like my public Facebook page, Prof. Lee R. Berger. Goodbye for now from the University of the Witwatersrand in Johannesburg, South Africa. Keep washing those hands and keep communicating science. So, as part of this series, just as Skok and Siobhan picked the last science storytelling effort I did, The Killer Cats of Gladysville, we're going to let you, the audience, choose the next challenge. Go to my Google Scholar page, Lee R. Berger, and pick one of my papers, either one from the distant past, one that's obscure, or one that you find particularly interesting, and challenge me to produce an interesting science storytelling video on that paper. Just email your suggestion to the email provided 
or you can just put it in the comments of one of the social media sites where these videos appear. We'll select one of those and I'll attempt to produce another interesting science storytelling video that you, the audience, chose.